I still didn't think I could be forgiven for my abortion. That was just one of those things that I, I had said no to God, no to his plan. And finally, the picture I got was this. If I was saying that Jesus' blood was not enough, then I, I was putting Jesus back up on the cross. And I couldn't do that. I'm Paul Hastings, and you're listening to Compelled, real people telling true stories about God's compelling love in their lives. As we've mentioned before, this is the first week of our podcast, and we're excited to release three episodes all at once to give you an idea of the types of stories we'll be sharing throughout this season. So make sure to keep listening after our story to hear a sneak peek of our next episode. As a word of caution, this episode deals with the very important yet graphic topic of abortion that may not be suitable for young listeners or listeners that have suffered from miscarriages. Our guest is Carol Everett, a woman who was so deeply deceived and hurt by her own abortion that she opened multiple abortion clinics of her own to hide her pain. Yet even after Carol was involved in the murder of thousands of children, God never gave up on her. He continued reaching out to her until she had no other refuge to turn to but him. This is the story of Carol Everett. Well, Carol, I just want to start out by saying thank you for joining us on this episode of Compelled. Um, this is something that I've really looked forward to for a long time, and I've known your story for quite some time, but always wanted the chance to just sit down and talk with you and ask you a bunch of questions. So thanks for thanks for being willing to do this. Uh, let, to start out with, can you just tell us about your childhood? Um, you know, was it a positive environment? Was it dysfunctional? I did have a dysfunctional childhood, but I didn't realize it was dysfunctional at the time. My father worked all the time and he traveled and my mother was very, very hurt, very injured by something early in her life that I still don't understand. My father was a butcher. He had a job at the grocery store during the day and at night he would butcher for the grocery store and he would bring the cattle in and he would shoot them and then he would butcher them. And I watched all that blood and all that. And I think to some extent that desensitized me to what I would do later in my life. And then I made bad choices. I got pregnant when I was 17. I actually, I got pregnant when I was 16. I delivered when I was 17. But that was a day when you uh, you got married very quickly and the baby came early. And so the father and I took responsibility for our actions and we got married and the baby came early. And then we had a second child, a daughter. He was in school. He got a degree in pharmacy. And when he got that degree, we didn't have any standards in our life. We weren't Christians. We didn't have anything to hold on to. And very quickly, we were divorced. Hmm. How old were you at that point? Divorced at 24 with two children. And and where did you turn at that point? I was in Austin, and so I had a job to some extent. My value came from work. It was not fulfilling, but I didn't know any different because I didn't know what fulfillment was. Hmm. So I just really didn't um, understand anything about life and what it was supposed to be at that time. Yeah. So what happened next? I remarried, and I had two children. He had one, and he wanted no more children, and I made an agreement that if I ever got pregnant, I would have an abortion because I never expected to get pregnant. Yeah. And we were married about three, two and a half years, and I became pregnant. Yes, 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 I thought a million times, I wish I just left him, and maybe we would have stayed together. Who knows? But I had the abortion, and the moment it was over, I knew I was a murderer. The moment it happened. The moment, the my first thought afterwards was, I'm a killer. I can't call my mother or my best friend. I can't call anyone and say I'm depressed. I've just killed my baby. No one would understand. My abortion was 11 months after Roe v. Wade. So it was very, you know, choice is wonderful. Everybody's supposed to be feel great when they have this choice. But the problem was that when you have this choice and you have nothing to hold on to and you know you've killed your child, uh, and everyone's telling you it's the best thing you can do, you start self-punishing. You start self-destructing. And I think women think, the world doesn't punish me, so I'll punish myself. And I started that path. How did your husband respond after the abortion? I actually thought he would uh, share my remorse, share my grief, but he didn't. Um, he said we'd done the best thing we could and we needed to go on with our lives. And uh, I hated him. I wanted him to hurt as I'd hurt, and our baby had surely hurt. And I started out on a destructive path to end our relationship. And I have two children, and I'm in a job where I can work hard and, and, 
and succeed. How old were you at this point? I was 28 at this time. I started getting drunk one day a month. That was a new pattern for me. Um, I was divorced, of course, at that point, So, but I was dysfunctional in so many ways. I, I went back to the doctor that did my abortion, who was my OBGYN, and said, I'm so depressed, and he put me on mood elevators, and I was on those mood elevators for probably four years. You get up every morning and take one. Um, nothing worked, but I found something that did. By 1976, I had met a man who owned abortion clinics through my job as in medical supply sales. And uh, he offered me a commission for selling abortions to the doctors that I met. He said, look, you're, ca you're calling on these doctors anyway. Just tell them about the clinic. I'll give you $25 for each abortion you refer. And I started referring abortions to him. And he is also the man who owned the medical supply company. So one day the call came for me. The director of the clinic didn't come in today. Can you come over and run this clinic today? Well, I'd been in medical offices for years, so I said yes, and I never left. I stayed there. And what happened was this. I learned a way to daily take care of my own guilt. I could say, if this woman is all right having an abortion and it is the best thing for her, then I'm okay. It was a sick, twisted justification of my own abortion. But then it changed because I was supposed to count. I was supposed to keep the records. I was supposed to do the reporting. So it became about money. I saw how much money he was making. I asked him to cut me in on the money. He said no, and I decided I would just take his best abortionist because I'd recruited him anyway, and we'd open our own clinic, and that's what we did. We planned. We placed our Yellow Page advertisement about eight months before we made the move. Then we made the move and opened our own clinic. And the first month we did 45 abortions, and the last month we did 545 abortions. And I remember those numbers because I was paid on a straight commission $25 for each abortion. And that $13,625 was not enough for me that last month. I still wanted to be a millionaire. And we had a plan in place to make me a millionaire the next year selling abortions. 40,000 abortions was my goal the next year. You know, you can't do 40,000 abortions out of one abortion clinic. I lived in Dallas at that time, and the plan was to surround the Dallas area with five abortion clinics. You bring them into the edge of town, they get their abortion, and they go back. And um, people came from all over the nation. Hmm. But that one-day traumatic dilation was probably very destructive to those women's cervix. As a matter of fact, the last 18 months, one out of every 500 women, one a month, had a hysterectomy, a colostomy, and one woman bled to death from a cervical tear of a 20-week abortion. And that was at your clinics? That was at our clinics. That was just in our clinics. That's not, you never, you know, one of the things that's so wrong with what's happening today is they still don't record abortion complications separate and apart from maternal complications. Women are still shamed. They don't say this is from an abortion. Now, that abortionist may have his handprint all over it. The doctor may figure it out, but they still record it a different way, a cervical tear. They don't say from abortion. So, for instance, we always took our patients that we knew that they were complications that had to be hospitalized. We didn't take them to the closest hospital. We didn't take them to the hospital that would have reporters. We took them across town to a hospital we knew would protect us where the doctor had enough pull to get them in, get them taken care of, maybe even get the bill written off, and no reporters, no one showed up, and no one said, what did you do? We didn't tell our employees when the woman died. She went home that night. The doctor left early. She was hemorrhaging. He left early. He had a date. He left her with me. She stopped bleeding. I thought she was okay. We sent her home about 10 or 10.30. She called him in the middle of the night, about 3 o'clock in the morning, somewhere between 2 and 3, and said, uh, her boyfriend said she's cramping, and without taking a history, he said, put her in a tub of hot water. Well, that would stop the cramps, but if she had already bled out, that hot water got pulled the last blood in that woman's body out. And when he called back and said she's not breathing, the doctor said, get her to the hospital. Well, it was 4 o'clock in the morning. She was dead. And so... Now, that one was a little bit tricky because he didn't take her to one of our hospitals, but 
It just so happened there was someone at that hospital that protected our doctor. He didn't care about protecting us. He protected the doctor. And so no one ever heard about it. The media didn't come. It was never on the news. Police didn't come. Nobody said you killed a woman. It was business as usual the next morning. There were two or three of them that were just weighing heavy on me that I knew that they were not only malpractice, they were, that was, that woman's life could have been saved. So I felt responsible, but I also blamed him, and he knew it. He manipulated me, and I was so, I allowed him. And how'd you know this doctor? He was my abortionist, so there's that sick twistedness and all that. What happened next? We kept on. We kept on, and we our goal was to open um, uh, those five abortion clinics, and we opened another one. It paid for itself in the first month. Second month, it was a cash cow. We had developed a system, but everybody in that fi- in that clinic fights. The doctors fight, the nurses fight, the counselors fight, and the partners fight. Our CPA told us about this man who could probably solve our problems. He said he could solve our problems by meeting with each of the owners an hour a week for four weeks. Now, I, he was very strange. He didn't talk about money at all. He acted like he was going to do this free. I didn't care how much he charged. I was going to be a millionaire next year, so I was ready to move. And the first time I met with him, he interviewed me. And the second time I met with him, I interviewed him. I wanted, you know, at that point in my life, I wanted to understand everybody who came close to me. And I couldn't figure out who this man was. He didn't drink. He didn't cuss. He didn't chew. He didn't run around on his wife. No drugs. Who was he? And I don't know why, but I said, are you a preacher? And he said, yes. And I said, what in the world are you doing in this situation? And he said, God sent me. And I was pretty sure he was crazy. And I quickly told him I was a Christian. I told him I had a Bible in the top right hand drawer of my desk, which I did. I told him I tithed on all that money, which I did. I told him I prayed every day. I prayed there'd be no deaths that day of women, of mothers, but there'd be a lot of abortions today. And he was not impressed. (laughs) He said, uh, Carol, my deacons and I have been praying for some time, and we believe there's someone inside this abortion clinic that God wants out. And he said, we are going to be leaving in 30 days. But he didn't stop there. He said, Carol, God loves you. He loves you, and he knows you can't be good enough. You can't work hard enough. You can't get yourself to heaven. You can't buy your way to heaven. But because God loves you so much, he's made a way of escape for you. He sent his son, Jesus Christ, to walk the face of the earth, to live that sin-free life, and to die on the cross as the perfect sacrifice for your sins. By this simple act of faith in Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord, your life can change. I've been a deal maker all my life, and that was a simple deal because he said, pray this prayer. And what I thought is, praying that prayer will shut that man up. So I said, yes. And he's kind of the king of the word prayer. He still is. And he said, I'm going to pray this prayer, and you pray it after me. And this is what he prayed. Dear God, I am a sinner. Please forgive me of my sins. Thank you for sending your son, Jesus Christ, to walk the face of the earth and die on the cross for my sins. Make me a, wor- uh, make me a worker in your vineyard. Amen. Simple prayer. Sinner's prayer. I know now. I didn't know then. Make me a worker in your vineyard. I got in that car, and that's the phrase that was ringing in my ears. And I'm thinking, does this crazy man think I'm going to leave all this money and go to California to work in a vineyard? Yeah. No, 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 no. When I got back to that abortion clinic, something had happened. They were not running in the front door, happy to be there. I'm certain it had happened before, but I'd never seen it. But they were all huddled over one side crying. And I started taking him back into my office and sitting down eye to eye and knee to knee and saying, why are you crying? And they'd tell me. And it was not anything big. I mean, you know, it was something that could have been overcome, but most of the time it was my parents would kill me. And I would say, no, your parents won't kill you. Your parents love you. Now, they're going to be disappointed, but they'll stand by you. They'll help you. Would you like for me to go home with you and help you talk to your parents? And um, at the end of that day, I was not saying, isn't this great? I saved three babies. 
I was saying I lost $75, money, money, money. And I went back to the abortionist's office, and I fell to my knees in the abortionist's office, and I prayed a heart prayer. Lord, if there is a Lord, if this is not where you want me, hit me over the head with a two-by-four. I did not know that he had a two-by-four, but he does. <laughs> and it was swift. Tell us about it. We were caught by the Channel 4, the CBS affiliate in Dallas, doing abortions on women who were not pregnant. They sent three reporters to the doctor to be certain they weren't pregnant. They wired them for sound, sent them in our abortion clinic to see if we would attempt to abort them, even though they clearly were not pregnant. We'd been tipped off. We knew they were coming. But you cannot control nine abortionists that work on a strike commission. And they caught us red-handed and documented. There it was, a one-week documentary on the news, how we sold abortions to young women who were not pregnant. The, the videographer saying, yep, babe, you're pregnant, got your money, why don't you just do it today? 27 days after that pastor said someone would be leaving in 30 days. And, you know, I didn't realize for years that I went back on the 30th day and moved all of my personal effects out. On the 30th day? As he predicted. As he said God would move, and he did. But... You know, I didn't walk out of there a happy pro-life woman. I walked out an angry, hurting, baby-killing, woman-killing woman. I had become so hardened in there. You know, anytime anything happened, I always trained my staff to say, but this is good for the woman, this is good for the woman, this is good for the woman. And I'd believe that lie. And um, God had to break me down. But... The man who led me to Christ and his deacons were not the only one praying for me. He had his church in Plano, Texas, praying for me. His entire church. They knew about the woman in the abortion clinic, and they were praying for her. And I didn't realize that until I walked out of the abortion clinic July the 27th, 1983. And I went to the church Thanksgiving dinner. Now, I was still scared. I was still scared of all of them. I was watching my purse. I was afraid they were going to get my purse or do something. You know, things you don't do as a Christian. And then somebody in the back said, whatever happened to that woman in the abortion clinic? And, oh, my whole body went stiff. <laughs> my daughter was with me. I mean, what's going to happen here? He said, she's doing just fine. She's doing just fine. So I was among them, and they didn't even know it. Huh. Some of them did, obviously. But God put me in a hospital. That church was a hospital. And they ministered to me. The man who led me to Christ and his wife spent some part of every day with me for 18 months. They discipled me. And I find Psalm 139 about six months after I came out of the abortion clinic. And as I read how each of us is fearfully and wonderfully knit together inside the darkness of our mother's womb, the thing that hit me was that I was involved in the murder of 35,000 babies. The maiming of 19 women, the death of one woman, and the sin I couldn't confess to anyone that I thought was unforgivable, taking the life of my own child by abortion. Uh, the man and woman who led me to Christ led me to First uh, John 1, 9. that says, if you confess and repent of your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. But I still didn't think I could be forgiven for my abortion. That was just one of those things that I, I had said no to God, no to His plan. Um, and I didn't think I could be forgiven. And finally, the picture I got was this. If I was saying that Jesus' blood was not enough, then I, I was putting Jesus back up on the cross. And I couldn't do that. And Romans 8, 1 says there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And I read those scriptures over and over and over again. And um, when I finally admitted to my children that I'd had an abortion, I cried for five months before that. I, I couldn't do anything. I just cried all the time. And the day came when I told them. And that's when the crying stopped. And one of them said to me, did you ever consider aborting me? And, of course, the answer was no. 
Thanks for sharing, Carol. I know that it must be incredibly difficult and hard to relive so many of these memories. Um, and I just want to thank you for doing that. Let's take a step backwards here in the story here and just ask, what happened after you left the abortion clinics? How did you make ends meet? So I had two kids in college, and uh, I had a, a purchased a butcher shop, if you can believe this, in, in Richardson, Texas. And so that was the only way I had to make a living. But I'd been pouring money into it, and it was not profitable. It never made a profit at all. But God took care of us. He just supplied every need. And my children had gone from being little spoiled brats to suddenly coming home and working in the butcher shop on the weekends. And he gave me that family who discipled me and that church that loved me. People that God sent to really pull me through in ways that you don't even know you need. The Lord knows what each of us needs and when we need it. I I mean, I, I never cease to be amazed at that. That's so true, and thanks for sharing that. Let's transition for a second here. Uh, Carol, I know that eventually you got involved into politics, and that's actually how you and I met. Um, Can you share with us how that came about? Well, by this time, I was in a weekly Bible study who met on Thursday nights. I'm going to church, and uh, we started taking evangelism explosion. And you have to learn to do your testimony in five minutes or less. And I had a Dallas Theological Seminary student washing my windows in the butcher shop. And so I thought, he's safe. I'll share with him. Yeah. Well, I shared with him. With the window washer. The window washer from Dallas Theological Seminary. (laughs) And his mouth dropped open. (laughs) And he didn't say anything. (laughs) And I thought, well, if I blew that man away, I can't ever tell anybody. (laughs) There's no way I can ever share it. Yeah. And he stepped back, and he didn't say anything. And he called me back the next day, and he said, you don't know it, but I'm a volunteer with the Dallas Right to Life. Wow. And we've been praying for somebody to come out of the abortion business. And so I am scared to death. And I call the man that led me to Christ and tell him. And he says, call it, call this attorney who's in the Bible study. And so he and the attorney set up this meeting with the Dallas Right to Life director. And they're coming in, you know, and they're going to talk. And it's pretty clear they're not trying to get anything from me. They're not trying to use me. But I'm scared to death. Yeah, because I'm going. They've asked me to testify before the Texas legislature on uh, regulating abortion clinics. That's amazing. So how'd it go? So the church met the night before. It was on a Monday morning, and the church met the night before. And I gave my testimony, and they all prayed for me. And then I flew down to Dallas to, to from Dallas to Austin to testify. And when I walked in the Reagan Building. All of my old friends from the abortion business were there, and they were sitting in the first two rows. They'd gotten there early, and the pro-lifers were going to last. We're in the back. You know, I knew God had written what I was to say, but I was scared. And I opened my Bible, and, and one of the deacons had given me Isaiah 41, 9 through 10. You whom I've taken from the end of the earth and called from its farthest corners, do not fear, I am with you. And I read that. And I knew it was just like God had spoken to me. I knew it was so clear that I was to do it. And I went back in, and I read that speech that I'd written. And that passed. But they only regulated abortion clinics to the point of four pages. So while they were regulated for the first time in Texas, they weren't really regulated. But... God used that for me to meet people, and people started calling me immediately and asking me to speak. And I was making this deal with God. Okay, Lord, I'll do it one day a week, one day. And before I knew it, I was going somewhere and doing something four or five days a week. Wow, that is awesome. Tell us about the organization you created, the Heidi Group. I had uh, gone through the process of working through my abortion and my own healing for that post-abortion syndrome. And when it, I reached a point that I needed to name my baby, I named her Heidi. Now, that has, has derivatives of noble in several languages, but that's not what it meant to me. It meant hidden. Heidi is hidden from the world, but she's alive in my heart and in my world because an abortion is a little bit of an unmourned death to a mother because we are the only ones who really knew her. 
But I wanted something that would hold up the light and say there is hope and help to men and women who've experienced abortion, but also to women who are in an unplanned pregnancy that you can have this baby. There is a way, and this is not the, it's not a disease, and it's not the worst thing that ever happened to you. There is a plan here for you to survive and to flourish. And um, somehow I thought that the name Heidi did it, so we started our nonprofit called the Heidi Group. And I've, you know, I've tried a little bit of everything. In 2009, um, we opened a charity prenatal clinic in Dallas. We had um, researched the state for at-risk women trying to get ahead of them before they got pregnant. And there were um, 5.2 million women in Texas at that time, 12 and over at risk. And uh, there were 1.3 in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. So we went to Dallas because I knew Dallas had been there. And... um, there were no no pregnancy centers in inner city Dallas or Fort Worth. And so um, we decided that we would go to the Salvation Army and ask them if they would allow us to put pregnancy centers in their facilities. And they did. They were gracious and wanted them. And it was really strange because we could only go in like one day a week. And we just put out a little sign that said free pregnancy test that day. And even in the senior citizen preg- preg- uh, Salvation Armies, we did pregnancy tests. Wow. Now, not with the senior citizens, but... I was about to say. <laughs> yeah, but they came in, but it was so funny because those senior citizens would lie in the halls when we went in, and they would be so glad to see us, and those poor girls had to walk the gauntlet to get to you know, to the pregnancy <laughs> center. <laughs> but we did pregnancy tests in every center we opened. We re- realized that 65% of those women didn't have any prenatal care, and they didn't plan on it because there's this emergency Medicaid thing that happens, and if they just pop into the hospital at the day of delivery— They have to deliver their babies, and it's paid for through emergency Medicaid, so they don't get prenatal care. And so we opened a facility in the 11th, at that particular time, the 11th most severely poverty-stricken area in the nation over in West Dallas. And the first day, we had 16 patients, and then in a couple of months, we had 60 a day. It was too many, but we were serving that population. Then 2009 hit, and the economy went belly up, and... Uh, I had a board member call me and say, Carol, I believe you're supposed to be working in Austin. And at that point, we had a 25% salvation ratio in that center. I was actually able to be in direct care and see them come to Christ and see them through their pregnancies. And I was loving it. I you know, had an apartment in Dallas in inner city. I was living there in it and learning so much and then had my home still in Round Rock. But Um, another board member called me and said, Carol, I think you're supposed to be working in the legislature again. And I, the first one I said, get thee behind me, Satan. This one I said, did you talk to him? And she said, no. But I said, okay, Lord, I think I hear you. Let's talk. Wow, that's awesome. So then, as I know, you moved back to Austin and have been here for almost the last decade actively fighting for life in the Texas legislature. And during this time period, uh, the Heidi Group wasn't actively running a clinic in Austin, but rather was focusing its energy on defunding Planned Parenthood and shutting down many of the abortion clinics across the state. Can you share with us what what happened next? I was concerned because we defunded Planned Parenthood, but I also had heard Planned Parenthood say that no one but Planned Parenthood could serve the women of Texas with low-income health care. And so I decided to form a coalition of pregnancy centers initially who would become medical and serve these women. And our goal was to provide it in areas that they had never provided it. Because remember, Planned Parenthood and those abortion affiliates always go to large cities. So I wanted to go to rural areas. Um, It's been an interesting fight because nobody knows, no one's ever done what we're doing. No one's ever asked individual doctors to provide health care through the state. They didn't know how to do it. We had to learn how to do it. We had to teach them. It's been an interesting experience. And then Medicaid waltzed into our office after we'd been doing this for a year and a half and said, you can't do this unless you're a direct care facility. And it was 11 o'clock one morning, and I want you to know I was pretty devastated. I didn't know how I was going to do what they wanted me to do quickly. Begin offering direct care. Care, yeah. And my goal was, oh, it's going to be, the first thing I thought, it's going to cost $300,000 to set up a clinic. How am I going to do that and do everything else and maintain what I've got? 
And so I went home, and my handyman was at the house, and I paid, went home to pay him, and he s told him what was going on, and he said, Carol, did you know that Austin Regional just abandoned an office less than a mile from your office? And I said, no. But a long story short, in two and a half hours, the Lord provided seven exam rooms and set up better than we would ever have been able to do it for $300,000. It wasn't fun in the beginning, I want you to know, because it was a stretch, but it's now I can say it's wonderful to see that he sent us a very strong message that he wants us in the healthcare business. That is so cool to hear uh, just how God provided this facility for you seemingly out of thin air just at the moment that you needed it. And thanks for sharing that. As we're wrapping up our interview, I've got a couple of last questions for you. The first question is, what would your advice be to someone who has had a loved one confide in them about having had an abortion in the past? The first thing you do, obviously, is pray, but you realize that she has trusted you. This man or woman, it could be a man, has trusted you with a deep, dark secret. So don't violate that. Be careful how you handle it. And don't talk about it unless they want to talk about it. But pray that God will heal them, that he will take that hardened, hard heart and turn it to a heart of flesh. And then he'll give them grace and favor to talk to it, to them. But then you use scripture when you're talking to them. You may not say chapter and verse, but use scripture and tell them. First John 1, 9, of course, is it? If you confess and repent of your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive and to cleanse you of all unrighteousness. Help them to confess because many times they haven't confessed. I had a call yesterday from a woman that I've been working with for 20 years, and she can't get over it. But she's still blaming herself. And so most of the time we are our own worst enemy because we continue to punish ourselves by remembering it. And that scripture, Romans 8, 1, no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus is so important to a post-aborted man or woman. But listen to them, listen to their pain, and pray with them every time because God really does want to heal them. And because they've opened up to you, he wants to use you to heal them. So you have a great opportunity to be a minister in your own area. Thanks for sharing everything that you've shared with us. Uh, one last question I have for you is for those that have been moved by your testimony today, how could they get involved in the pro-life movement or in saving babies' lives? Well, first you pray, and then you see what's available in your area. And I think it's important to interview everyone before you make a decision. Go to the Right to Life group. See if that's see what their needs are. See what they want you to do. Go to your local pregnancy resource center. Ask them what they want to do. I'm very partial to pregnancy resource centers because they are so evangelical. But find out what's out in your area. But before you give to one, check them all out in your area. See which one you fit in. And then um, learn what's going on. Learn about what's happening. You know, we saw those horrible videos with the sale of the baby's body parts. Mm -hmm. Understand what's happening in your area so you can educate. You know, you are the best educator of your friends. It's so easy to talk to someone that you know about. Did you know that they were selling baby's body parts? Or uh, you're not going to go get out on the streets and get in an elevator and say that. So you can be the educator to, uh, for people to understand what's going on. So, uh, and, you know, call the Heidi Group. 512-255-2088 or go online, uh, www.heidigroup.org and uh, tell us you need help. We'll help you. And it, all over the nation, we have contacts that we can click you into. All right. Thank you so much. We've been listening to Carol Everett. Carol, it's been a pleasure sitting and listening and talking with you. Just thank you so much for being here. Well, thank you. And thank you for what you're doing to get the truth out. Appreciate it. What an amazing story of redemption. It's incredible that God would take someone that was so hurt and broken and then use them for his kingdom. Carol's story shows firsthand that no one is too hurt or too horrible to be used by God. You can learn more about Carol's ministry at HeidiGroup.org. You can also find links to her ministry, her book, and more at our website, CompelledPodcast.com. If you enjoyed our story, then you'll be glad to know that there are more on the way. As I already mentioned, this is the first week of our podcast. Normally, we release episodes every Tuesday, but for this week only, we're releasing three episodes all at once. And in just a minute, we'll play you a sneak peek of our next episode. You can find all of our episodes and more at our website, compelledpodcast.com. You can also hear our episodes by subscribing to Compelled on iTunes, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, Overcast, or Pocket Casts. If you enjoyed our show, then we'd super appreciate it if you'd leave us a review and a five-star rating on iTunes. 
Also, consider sharing this episode with others that would be blessed by Carol's story. Our show was edited by Zach Fowler, who is a gifted film editor, visual effects artist, and storyteller. You can find Zach and his work at ZachFowlerImagery.com. Our logo was designed by Josiah Jost, an incredibly talented logo designer. You can reach Josiah and view his work at SciDesign.com. Our website was created by Ben Billups, a digital developer extraordinaire. You can follow Ben on Instagram at Ben.Billups. Special thanks to my wife, Sarah Hastings, for helping make this project a reality. Without her, this podcast wouldn't exist. And that's it for this episode. Stick around after the music for a sneak peek at our next episode. I'm your host, Paul Hastings, and you've been listening to Compelled. We'll see you next Tuesday. A fire started, I think it was maybe five miles away from Wilderness Ridge. By the next morning, it, it, the Wilderness Ridge was completely destroyed. 40,000 acres were burned at that time, and 1,600 uh, people were displaced, and uh, including Wilderness Ridge. The house that we lived in was destroyed. Total devastation in, uh, of not only property, but you know, our lives.